you brought your Bibles, and I trust that they will probably fall open to the book of Acts by this time. So if you would, be opening up your Bible to the book of Acts, and we're going to be in the 18th chapter. We're going to uh, be looking today at companions in ministry. Uh, we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses of uh, this particular passage. And so if you'll be opening up there, I'm going to kind of set things in order and, and, and catch you up. Uh, we left our study of Acts back in November. And so uh, the very first verse that we look at is going to start with three words. Acts 18.1 just says, After these things. And when it says after these things, it's talking about Paul addressing uh, the people in Athens, actually at Mars Hill, uh, addressing the Greeks about how the gospel transcends culture. We looked at that the last time we talked about the book of Acts, about the, uh, the gospel and culture, and that culture doesn't change the gospel. The gospel needs to be changing the culture, that the gospel transcends the culture, that philosophy and tolerance of whatever belief someone may hold will not save them. They, there at Mars Hill, had a statue to the unknown God. And, and so Paul took that opportunity and he shared with them that their unknown God was in fact a knowable creator who sent his son into the world to redeem a fallen man from the curse of sin and to restore to that man a new life that's found in Jesus and Jesus only. And we looked at that new life last week when we talked about a happy new you. Paul finds himself in Athens as a crusader of truth, but the problem is at this point he finds himself alone. You see, uh, he had carried Silas and Timothy with him to Berea, but when he came on to Athens, they stayed behind in Berea. They stayed in the, in the Macedonia area where he had left them. And you know what I've discovered over the years? It's easy to feel alone in the ministry when you're physically by yourself. And with that, sometimes comes depression. I was noticing that last year Barnes did a study and reported, and I, I was a little surprised by this. I, I shouldn't have been, but I was. Barna reported that 42% of those in the ministry and clergy had considered quitting during the two years that we went through COVID and the government regulations. That it just felt as though they were alone in what they were doing, and it was so difficult to do it. And what keeps men in ministry is the realization that they are not alone. And so it is here in the 18th chapter of Acts that we're going to discover that Paul is about to discover that he has companions in the ministry. Uh, Elijah actually suffered from this when he was in his ministry. Some of you remember the story. You'll find it mostly in, in 1 Kings chapters 18 and 19. Uh, when Elijah went up against the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. He had something that he said to them on a couple of occasions. And then later, after it was all over, uh, Jezebel went to pursue after him, and he found himself in a cave. And Paul records for us what took place in that cave. In Romans chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, and I'm just going to take a little digression here for just a second and show you this. Uh, when Elijah was beginning to feel the depression of being alone in ministry, he said to God, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone and left. And now they seek my life. Jezebel and those whom she has sent, they're seeking my life. In fact, uh, in chapters 18 and 19 of 1 Kings, he says this little speech about three times. Paul knew this story. He knew what the end of the story was. So that's why in Romans, in verse 4, he says, but what does the divine response say to him? What did God say to him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. You're not in the battle alone. You're not in the ministry alone. Paul knew that God had not left Elijah alone in the struggle for the truth. That there were those out there that Elijah just hadn't met yet. And he was not alone. And, and, and neither was Paul. As he found himself there in Athens, he wasn't alone. Uh, 
Let me just tell you, when you feel like you may be the only one at your work or school or in your area who loves Jesus and is serving Him the way that you're doing, know this, that God has many more companions in faith, companions in ministry, and you are not alone. You would be surprised when you start looking around. Paul found more Christ followers and workers where God was sending him. And this is where we're going to look at today in the 18th chapter. We're going to be beginning with, uh, here in the first four verses, a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And he says, and, and going back to Acts, Acts chapter 18, verse 1, uh, that uh, he, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and he went to Corinth. He found a certain Jew named Aquila. Aquila was born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, if you don't have a map, this doesn't make a lot of sense to you. So let me just kind of help with you. Uh, he was born in Pontus, which was the northeast region of Asia Minor, where Paul had been. And he relocated from there all the way over to Italy. And he was in Italy when... The gospel arrived. Y'all remember Cornelius? He was of the Italian cohort. He was from Italy. And the gospel had made its way from, from there all the way into Italy when Peter shared with the first Gentile about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they get to Italy and Aquila and his wife Priscilla come to become believers. But then there becomes this issue between the Jews and the Christians there. And, and in fact, it even says in verse 4 that uh, he had come from Italy with his wife because Claudius, who was the emperor at that time, commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. So they departed from Rome and now came to Greece. And it was there in Greece that Paul would catch up with them. He came to them. Rest of verse 4. And so it was there that uh, Paul found him. God had his people. And what we have discovered over the years is that Paul is that God can move his people around wherever he needs them to be for whatever purpose he needs them to be. This was a godly couple. They found they could serve God better together than apart. I remember when Cindy and I first started dating, we were in college, and one of the things that we talked about was uh, whether or not to get married. Well, one of the criteria was to... <clears throat> Can we serve God better together than we can apart? She wanted to be a missionary. She wanted to go off and be a, like a Lottie Moon. She wanted to go off and, and be a, a single missionary. But God began to share with us that He could use us better together than He could apart. And so it was at this point that we find Aquila and Priscilla as a great role model for one, at least one good reason for getting married, that you can serve God better as a couple. And as a couple, I want to make this, make, make this uh, clear as well. They were equal. They were equal in Christ. Paul will make this clear when he starts talking about the, the different roles between men and women. But he says they are one in, in Christ. There's neither male nor female. They are the same in Christ. Sometimes, if you look through this story, you'll find in Acts and then in the other places where these two are mentioned, sometimes they are listed Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila being the man and Priscilla being the woman. But sometimes they are listed Priscilla and Aquila. Or Prisca and Aquila. And that's because God doesn't deem one of the two individuals more important than the other. They were equal in Christ. They were equal in marriage. They had different roles. Now, this isn't going to be one of those messages about the roles of between husbands and wives or men and women in ministry. But it is to say that regardless of your role in life or regardless of your role in ministry, the value is the same in God's eyes. This was a couple that God looked at together. And we learn that from Priscilla and Aquila that a woman doesn't have to be a pastor to be deemed important in the work of God. Look at Lottie Moon. We just celebrated her. We just took an offering for missions because of her. She was not a pastor, but she was certainly involved in the work and the ministry of God and as such was deemed of value and importance. And we just need to, we just need to make that that. that understanding. Importance and value doesn't come from the office. It comes from being obedient in the calling where God has placed you. God places you where He wants you, not necessarily where you want to be. 
So Paul would note that when he came to Corinth in weakness and fear, when he wrote the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 3, he says, I came in weakness and fear, but Priscilla and Aquila, they welcomed him into their workplace, they provided him with meaningful employment, and they facilitated his missionary activities. Looking now at verse 3, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. Tent making was more than just a trade for Paul. And it's something I don't want to just gloss over lightly. He references it, in fact, on several occasions, not only in a physical sense of his work and, and, and his vocation, but also using tent making in illustrations of spiritual truths that he will share with churches a little later on. He used the trade to supply his needs so that he wouldn't be a burden to the church at Corinth that was starting to be formed as he was there. Uh, if you were to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, it says, When I was present with you and in need, uh, oh, excuse me, and when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, and we'll see this in a moment, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, Silas and Timothy, they're going to be a part of it. But in everything, he says, I kept myself from being a burdensome to you. I worked. So I will keep myself. I know what he's talking about. In, in ministry, we talk about bivocational pastors. And uh, Gibson County has, has a, a, in fact, the majority of their pastors are bivocational, who support themselves through a work outside of the church. Paul was the same thing. In Corinth, he was a bivocational pastor or missionary. And interesting is that the, the term today has now come into vogue of tent makers. We have ministers and missionaries today called tent makers for this very reason. Paul used tent making as well as the gifts that came from Timothy and Silas when they arrived from Macedonia to support him so that he wasn't completely dependent upon the church at Corinth. And so do missionaries. We have missionaries around the world today who actually have a work platform that they work from which enables them to be able to come into a country and be able to be freely able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because they have a work platform and not just a missionary platform. In addition to this literal sense of being a tent maker, he used the art of tent making to explain many spiritual truths. When he wrote Timothy, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, a passage that we are familiar with, study to show thyself approved, New King James says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and then uses this expression, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, that expression, rightly dividing, was a tent-making expression. It had to deal with sewing. It had to do with cutting. And that just as he was able to cut straight, he was able to handle straight the Word of God and was teaching Timothy to do the same. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, and I shared a little bit of this in our Sunday school class this morning, he uses the illustration of the tent to talk about our mortality, to talk about these bodies. And last week I had the, the privilege of being able to attend the funeral of, of one of my mentors, Mo Eckel who passed at the age of 79 and, and was able to speak into the folks, uh, having a small part in the, in the service, speak into the folks what he meant to, to me and to so many others that were there that day. What I noticed in that funeral was that nobody had a sense of remorse or, or, or for, foreboding. It was a celebration, a genuine celebration. Because what they had come to realize was that Mo's tent had now been exchanged for a home, a home in heaven. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands that is eternal in the heavens. This house is our new body. We talked about this some last week when we talked about uh, the, the new you that will come, that we have a new uh, destination, we have a new body as well as a new home. And that this, uh, this new body is described in comparison to what we have today. What we have today is just a tent compared to what we're going to have, which he calls a building or house. For we, verse 4, who are in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, completely covered, 
that this mortality would put on immortality. And that's the sense of that new home in heaven. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. The earthly tent, this body. God used, or excuse me, John used the same imagery when speaking of Jesus' dwelling in human flesh. He says, and, and the Word was made flesh and literally tented or tabernacled among us in the first, gospel, in the first chapter of John 1. Peter would use the same imagery when talking about his own death in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent, my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Paul shared in both work and ministry with Aquila and Priscilla. What work do you do? What work do you find yourself? It should be more than just putting food on the table. More than just providing for a home and for a family. The work that you do is the way that God provides for you to meet your physical needs, just like with Paul, it was his tent making, but that we all have outreach opportunities in ministry. And so the question really would be, what kind of ministry do you have in addition to how you are serving the Lord through what you do? After some time there, we'll see in, in, as we get into next week, after some time in Corinth, Paul determined to return to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila will be going with him. They were committed to the early Christian ministry. They will accompany Paul across the Aegean Sea to Ephesus, where their ministry will continue. And it is there we will find them next week as they discover a man by the name of Apollos. This is actually a kind of a two-part message. The companions of Paul are actually companions in ministry. And we're going to see uh, Aquila, Priscilla, and a couple others this week. We'll see Apollos and others next week. But when they went across and they, they were beginning to work for the kingdom... Paul remembers them in three of his letters. Not only in the book of Acts do we find Aquila and Priscilla, we find them in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, the churches of Asia, he says, greet you. He was writing from that area of Asia Minor. And he says, the churches from Asia of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla, who are now here with me, they were with me there in Corinth, but now they're here with me and they're with me as I write this letter back to you. They greet you heartily in the Lord along with the church that is in their house. After leaving the area, Paul writes and mentions the couple that so many of them would have known, those who are in Corinth would have known this couple. And they're still in the service of the Lord. And they're even hosting a church in their home. Years later, they will have made a transition from where they were in Ephesus back to Rome. When Paul writes his letter to the Romans, guess what he does? He greets Aquila and Priscilla while they're now in Rome. And so they travel back up to Rome. They travel back up to Italy. And while they're there, uh, Paul writes the believers in Rome. And uh, he gives them uh, greetings. But he does more so than that. Look at this. Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. It's on the screen behind me. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They are there. Verse 4. Who risked their own necks for my life. To whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. The legacy of Aquila and Priscilla as a couple in service to the Lord extended farther than just helping Paul when he was in Corinth. And then later we will see with Apollos. They went to Rome. They worked with the church in Rome. And then they come back to Ephesus, and guess what? When Paul writes his final letter to Timothy there at Ephesus... Guess where Quilla and Priscilla are? They're back in Ephesus. In 2 Timothy 4.19, he tells Timothy to greet Prisca, that's Priscilla, and Aquila. Notice the order is now the woman first, and the household of Anisphorus. Now, if you don't recognize that name, that was the slave that Paul sent back to his master Philemon. And he not only went back in obedience and submitted himself to Philemon, he also formed a house church. All of these are workers together with Paul. All of these are companions in ministry. And most of them are laymen. Only as we look at Silas and, and Timothy in just a moment will we see people who are actually going to be engaged in ministry. But most of the people who are serving as companions in ministry are laymen. People like you. Who just say, I, I don't know what I can do for the Lord. God knows what you can do. And He has a place for you, not just in this church, not just attending, but in ministry and in service.
That's why the title of this message is Companions in Ministry and not just Paul's Companions. We're talking about Paul's companions, but the idea is that God has these companions in ministry everywhere. And as such, there are lessons that you and I need to learn from these examples that he gives to us in Acts 18. For example, lessons from Aquila and Priscilla. When we look at these lessons, the first thing I want you to see is that you can serve God as a family. They did. They served as a couple. We don't know about the children, but we do know that they served him as a family. It wasn't just one or the other. It was both. We use the expression that he or she completes me. Well, let me tell you something. As you complete one another, discover how Christ completes you as a couple. When I have an opportunity to talk to families that are kind of struggling, and I talk to a husband and a wife, and I say, you know, you see yourself at two different places perhaps in life, but here's what you need to discover. If you'll get your focus off of the distance between you and put your focus on God above you, and then as you begin to grow closer to God, guess what? You'll grow closer to each other. Greatest marriage counseling you can ever, ever give and ever share is that the closer that a couple gets to God, the closer they will get to each other. We need to learn to serve God as family. And secondly, we need to learn to serve God wherever we are. I've mentioned all these different places that Aquila and Priscilla lived to show you that they were not in one location and they weren't just fixed and they weren't just given a task in a place. Sometimes it's easy for us to just to, to get settled in and to fall into a routine or into something that we say, well, this is, you know, I've always been here and this is what I've always done. We serve God wherever we are. That's why the, the Great Commission is, as you are going, make disciples of all nations. In our increasingly transient society, and in an era with ongoing cultural change, it remains essential that we keep our spiritual bearings. That we always know where true north is. That wherever we go, we take Christ with us. We take the message of the gospel with us. That we take the claims of Christ with us in such a way that wherever we go, God can use us. There are some families that have just recently have had to move out of the church to go to new locations, to new towns, to new cities, to new states. My prayer is that they have taken now everything that they have heard and learned from this church with them. To serve God wherever you are. We are members of Christ and citizens of the kingdom first. I don't care what, what state you like to identify with. You are a citizen, not just of the United States. We've got some in our church getting ready to go over and have to use a passport to get into another country. And it's going to say we're citizens of the United States. We're more than citizens of the United States. We are citizens of heaven. And we're citizens of heaven first. The third thing we learned from Aquila and Priscilla is to serve God whatever it takes. Uh, his comment to the church at Rome seemed kind of casual and it passed by quickly, but I, I just want to remind you that he says that they demonstrated courage by giving their necks for him and for the cause of Christ. Priscilla and Aquila's story is one of risk. It's one of obedience. And again, we may be unclear about what the details of their courageous act on Paul's behalf was, but we know that it was meaningful and potentially costly and possibly dangerous. When the moment arose, Priscilla and Aquila literally were willing to bare their throats to the blade, is what that passage is saying, for the sake of their friend and the cause of Christ. Go back to Romans, I mean, back to eight, uh, Acts 18. You'll see that after he has met them and been working with them and they have been companions in ministry, that verse 4 says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuaded both Jews and Greeks, and he's still doing what he's been doing of using the synagogue as a base of operation because there he knows the Jews have some understanding of Scripture and therefore he can start sharing the fulfilled prophecies. It isn't too long before verse 5 he's joined by Silas and Timothy. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, where he had left them at Berea, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. That is his objective. That is his overarching goal is to share Christ and Him crucified. 
Now, as we have found in other places where Paul has preached, verse 6 says, When they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. And then he makes this definitive statement. It seems like, it seems like he's already done this on other occasions, but now he says it, says it in a kind of a declaration, From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Paul made it a point that he had come to share the gospel and he wasn't going to be put off just simply because some weren't going to accept the message. As you share in your opportunities, there will be those who will not be able to, to embrace what you're sharing. Some who will reject the gospel and the claims of Christ. But never let that stop you. Go to those who will hear you. Don't just beat a dead horse. Learn that there are some who are waiting for you to come, waiting for you to share, and give that opportunity for God to be able to use you in their situation. And so then he says <clears throat> that when they came, they brought encouragement and insistence from Macedonia. Uh, I've already mentioned this, but here's what he writes in the church to his letter to the church at Corinth. At Corinth. And when I was present with you at Corinth and in need... I was a burden to no one. We've already saw that. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. This is who he's talking about. He's talking about Silas and Timothy. That God uses people, some people we've already worked with, who, who come back and, and, and strengthen us at times. Folks, there are people who were once a part of this church that need to be back in this church. They were those whom we have worked with or you have worked with in the past and they are needful to come back. Just like Timothy and Silas came and rejoined Paul, there are those who you could reach out to and say, you know what, we need you at Medina. You need to come back. We need you to come back. And so they came back and they supplied what, what was lacked. And the lessons we learned from Silas and Timothy are basically twofold. There are those like Silas and Timothy who support the work wherever they can. They were supporting it in Macedonia and brought it, brought that support with them to Corinth. And not only that, they learn to support the work as it goes forward. They're always looking to where God is headed next. We must never get to the place where we feel like we have arrived and that we are at the place where God wants us to be from this point on. No, we are always to be going forward. And that's when God brings unexpected people into our paths to assist us in the journey. And the reason is God has people everywhere. Thing is, we just haven't met them yet. And he's wanting us to find him. Let me share with you a couple more that are from this passage that he came in contact with. Beginning at verse 7, he says, He departed from there and entered the house. And we see Justice, Justice and Crispus. He departed from there, entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house conveniently was next door to the synagogue. Now, he had already been sharing in the synagogue and he had already been finding converts. And we're going to find that one of those converts was the head of the synagogue. But now that he's moving his attention to Gentiles, he comes into the home of justice and he sets up a house church. If you look through the book of Acts, you'll find that most churches were not buildings like we, we have. Most churches were homes. And they began in homes. And justice was one of them. He was a house church. We have them today. They're called home Bible studies. People who have given the use of their home to allow believers to gather to study the Word of God. And sometimes those gatherings involve unbelievers who learn about God in the process of having a Bible study in, the, in someone else's home, someplace they don't feel threatened. Justice opened his home and his house was next door to the synagogue. Verse 8, Then Crispus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, he believed on the Lord with all his household. And what was the result? Many of the Corinthians. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, were baptized. This is how the church at Corinth really got started. It wasn't just reclaiming the synagogue 
It was starting a church. And the church began in the home of justice. Some of the lessons we can learn from justice and Crispus is, and the first one is very obvious, huh, use your home as needed for whatever God wants you to use it for. There may come a time where we will look for opportunities for you to open your home as a Bible, a place for home Bible study. And the important thing is that as companions in ministry, and it doesn't matter whether we're laymen or, or, or vocational, that's not the point. It's that we are all in ministry. And as co-laborers and companions in ministry, we use what God has given us. If you have a home, use it for the glory of God. Use it for the opportunity to, to have a, a place where, where believers and maybe even some non-believers can meet to learn about Christ. And secondly, as we've already discovered with, with Aquila and Priscilla, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. Because what we discover is, just as they were willing to bear their, their neck to the blade, they were committed to doing whatever it takes to see the gospel go forth. We don't live in a y'all come society of church anymore. Church culture is not y'all come. Church culture is go ye therefore. And much of the evangelism that will need to be taken place, if we're going to see, and, and, and I, use, I know you hear me use the expression old Medina and new Medina. Well, I've been reminded that old Medina is becoming a new Medina. <laughs> that they're taking on their own new qualities and characteristics. And that there's things going on there that aren't the way they always have been. But whatever, whether it's old or new, Medina needs a church presence that is willing to be in the community and not just on the bypass. In verses 9 and following, it says, The Lord spoke to Paul in a, a night vision, and here's what he said. Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not be afraid. But speak. Do not keep silent, Medina. Do not keep silent. I am with you and you are not alone. God said to Paul specifically, no one will attack you or to hurt you. But the bottom line is, because I have many people in this city. And God has many people in this city. And what we need to be looking for are companions in ministry, companions in Christ. Paul discovered as the work of the kingdom was going forward that it would involve new people, new places, new work, new results. The church was never become settled where it has been. We talked in the Sunday school class this morning from Zephaniah chapter 1 how Israel had become settled on its leaves, which was just a, an old English way of saying had become complacent. They'd become satisfied. May Medina First Baptist Church never be satisfied. May we always be looking forward to the advancement of the kingdom of God to the point that God's name is proclaimed wherever God, whether it's to a ball game or to a play or wherever. The church must never become settled with where it has been, with what it has done, or just who it has engaged in the past. If Acts 18 teaches us anything, it teaches us that companions in ministry must be discovered. They must be embraced. They must be learned to be trusted and to serve alongside. We'll see new faces come into this church. We need to learn how to Meet them, greet them, embrace them, and trust them as they indicate their desire to want to be a part of what they see God doing in this church. When the church keeps doing what it has always done, it will become stagnant. Somebody once said, if we keep doing what, we'll be do what we keep doing, we'll keep getting what we've been getting. Well, the way to avoid that is to do something different and to move forward. We have a whole field of potential just beyond the tree line. We just need to take it. And I believe that there we will find Aquila's and Priscilla's waiting to be a part of what God is doing.
I think there we will find old friends who are still valuable to the work and ministry of this church. I think over there we'll find that we will find new friends wanting to open their homes to be bridges for the kingdom. What you and I need to realize is that Medina First needs to be looking for companions in ministry. And as we do, we need to make ourselves available to be involved first, that we get beyond just the chores and get about the work that is in the fields. Let's be about going forward, seeking companions in ministry. Amen? Let's pray.